All right, let's get rolling. How many folks were in here yesterday with me? Uh, just a few, okay. There'll be a few pieces of this that uh, are a little bit uh, redundant in nature to you, but the body of the seminar is obviously uh, relating to the USBC Youth Membership product and how you can be effective in your marketplace and, and using it. So some of the elements are kind of similar, um, but really the content is completely different. We've also got some slides relating to the uh, sport, new sports logic system. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Chad Murphy. Uh, I am, have been managing director of the International Bowling Campus Youth Team. Uh, I'm also uh, have just recently, yesterday, been appointed as executive director of USBC, which is pretty fun. So thank you. Um, my message here in, in that piece is, yes, this new venture, this new job is very important uh, to me and a lot of other folks, uh, but the one that I'm vacating is equally as important to the industry. Um, so the support for that area will, will continue to, to be maintained at a very, very high level. And so today we're here to talk about youth and the new youth membership product, um, cover just a couple housekeeping things. If you guys haven't seen this portal, please check it out. It's our Youth Resource Center. Um, at bull.com. It's a real simple URL. You can find it about 30 different ways within bull.com. You can type in bull.com slash youth resource center. You can go to bull.com and click on one of the banners that say youth resource center. You can go to the youth page and there's a youth resource center banner there. We're trying to make it very easy and accessible. How many of you are BPA members? Just kidding. It's a bull expo. Uh, the uh, Youth Resource Center is now also available inside the new BPA.com. So if you're you know, inside the member section at BPA.com, you can find it there. What's inside of there? The simple answer is anything that you could possibly need or want when activating a youth bowling program. What's a youth bowling program? Pretty much anything and everything, from the little kids all the way up to the big kids, tournaments, USBC membership, how-to guides, best practices, Marketing materials. Marketing materials. We need better marketing materials if we're going to get outside our four walls and attract some folks. Can't necessarily just keep doing it the way we've been doing it for a long time, a thousand words on a page. Let's get down to a central message. Learn to bowl, have some fun, compete with friends, that type of stuff to attract a mom or a dad to want their, put their kid in a program. But this is your one-stop shop for everything youth bowling. Um, the one-on-one tab is kind of all the league pieces. Uh, your standard Saturday morning program, after school, home school, everything that would go with that. Bullopolis is your birthday party piece. You want to send somebody out from your birthday party with something to come back in center like a bounce back coupon. Download them, customize them to your center needs and put it in as part of your program. Um, USA Bowling is our coaching mainstream sports model. Everything that goes with that, um, and you can check it out. There's a ton of marketing materials, how-to guide. If you want to run Little League Baseball in a bowling center, that's your central hub. USBC Youth, a lot of what you're going to see today is centered inside of there. Our membership pieces, um, uh, really everything related to what we do with the USBC Youth brand. And then Scholastic, Contact Us, Bowler's Ed, how to get bowling. How many are you using Bowler's Ed? Okay, now everybody raise your hands. Everybody raise your hands. That's how many people should be using Bowler's Ed. It's just no more powerful tour. What's that? Ours is a little old school. It's the old day Bowler's Ed. The old Bowler's Ed show, Jack says. Uh, it just isn't a better tool uh, than having a PE teacher do what we would do in the center, which is teaching kids how to bowl. If they can give them a min minimum level of instruction in a PE class, and then they come into a center and able to knock down some pins, that's about half if not three quarters of the battle. Not necessarily talking about good bowling cores and great cover stocks and the advanced piece of the game. You know, just a one step staggered stance with a delivery all the way back to three and four steps. So if you're not using Bowler's Ed, now's the time. Um, Sean Clancy, who was in the back of the room, wave your hand, Sean. Stop by and see that young man at the youth booth this week. You guys were already gonna come by, so while you're there, just stop and talk to Sean about uh, Bowler's Ed. I think that's a, a piece that would improve your business just pretty much instantly if you're willing to do it. But that resource center was built and is, uh, was created for you, anyone that's activating a youth bowling program. The agenda for this, we're going to talk about some of the experts 
the landscape of youth polling. Why do we fail as an industry? Is our industry failing? 67 million people went bowling last year. So are we really failing? You know, there's a lot of folks going bowling. But on the organized side of the sport, our leagues are down for the most part. We've got fewer centers. And so everyone likes to use big words like fail. Um, I agree that thing, when things don't completely work properly, we need to learn from them. But we're not failing as an industry. There's lots of folks going bowling and, and enjoying our great game. Uh, activity in a way that is social and also competitive for those folks who want it. Um, so we'll talk about that. We'll cover the new youth membership model. Awards. Those guys at USBC, boy, they don't know what they're doing. They eliminated that awards program and took it away from the kids. These kids have been getting those awards for years and you guys took it away. You don't believe in it. It doesn't make sense. Simply not the case. We're going to explain a new way to do awards, and we'd like to change the conversation from awards to recognition, because that's what's important. You know, having these kids be recognized for their achievement in very simple, succinct, effective, and quick ways through immediate gratification. We'll cover some apparel options, the youth ladder, and then I'll close with something profound, hopefully, if I'm up to it today. Um, feel free to go out, Google couple of these studies. Youth Sports in America was commissioned by Michigan State, extracurricular activities. Um, I said this yesterday, we'll try it with this group. How many people think bowling is a game? How many think it's an activity? How many of you believe in it as a sport? All above. It's all the above, but when someone comes in, a seven-year-old, me, someone comes into the sport that's never played it before, what is it? Is it a sport to them? It's a game. It's an extracurricular activity. It's something that our parents, I like to think of myself as a parent today, I try to be a good one, but we're figuring that out as we go along. Um, as a parent, we choose for our kids, or our kids choose to tell us that they're going to do regularly outside of school and home and probably church. We are an extracurricular activity to, at the beginning, and they don't know how to play it. All right? I mean, have you ever seen anybody go bowling for the first time? Put your hand in the ball and kind of, so you got these two, right, sometimes? Sometimes it's maybe these two, sometimes it's just pick it up, you know, go. All right, there's lots of ways. But how do we be effective in figuring that out? And these are two studies that will help us do that. And then how do we uh, be successful within marketing the sport? Building an experience in center that a child would enjoy and want to come back and do again. I mean, the beauty of having kids do a, a number of certain things. What's the number one birthday party destination in the U.S.? What's the number one birthday party destination in the U.S.? Chuck E. Cheese is big, you're right. It's bowling. It's bowling. Where 10 million kids go bowling a year. About 80% of them through birthday parties. It's a great place to talk to somebody about bowling again. Right? I mean, it, it just is. So how we transition them from something to something else. They come in on a field trip. Is there a way to get them to come back? You know, all of those things. And the answer, the secret sauce, if, if you will, is in the experience. What they do and how much fun they have while they're there. You would agree, hopefully, that if you threw less gutter balls, they might have more fun. Right? So just basic level skill instruction. If you bottle up these two studies, this is what they want. These studies will tell you that we have to give them what they want, when they want it. We have to immediately gratify them. We have to have programs that are uh, supported by parents and participated in by parents. My son loves it when I fill in as coach of his baseball team. The other kids, they know I don't know what I'm talking about. But my son loves it when I'm a part of that. Bowling is no different. We've got to have parents be involved. The backbone, if you take one thing from today, the backbone of youth sports, sports is volunteers. 
coaches, team moms, team managers. That's it. In a nutshell, we've got to have people managing these programs in a quality, passionate way. What they want, they want skill instruction, building self-worth. They're not aspiring to be a 200 average bowler at this level. They want to go from 51 to 52. They want to go from 63 to 66. They're measuring, their measuring stick is on whatever they just did. If their measuring stick might be keeping the ball in the lane one more time a game from four to five over 20 shots. I mean, it's, it's all in the individual consumer, but they've got to feel like they are progressing, which is going to build their self-confidence. And your programs have to deliver that. They have to deliver that. They have to deliver that. Second piece is when they want it. 50 million kids are doing something else on Saturdays. But for the most part, we are only activating youth bowling on the Saturdays. And for those of you that were here yesterday, you're not allowed to answer my uh, questions. But we did a study of non-bowlers, and we asked them, you know, when's the best time to floor a, a youth league? If you were going to bowl in a youth league, when would you do it? We gave them Tuesday, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Friday, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, and Sunday afternoon. What was the number one answer? It was Sunday and Thursday were real close. Sunday afternoon and Thursday were, were, were almost neck and neck. What was the worst answer given? Saturday morning. We asked them what time of year, August, uh, October, October to before Christmas, January to March, April uh, to June, and then in the summer, what was the number one answer? January to March was the number one answer. What was the worst answer? August. You ever try to stick 30 pounds into a 10 pound bag? I mean, we were putting so much time and effort into a time and place that they don't want and then wondering why we don't get the, the uh, support. Why, why do we fail in this area in some cases? And failure is relative. I mean, there's some centers in this country and some of you in this room and you don't have to raise your hand. We're not going to identify you. But if you had 20 kids right now, you'd, you'd believe you were doing well. And if you had zero, I would believe you were doing well. 20 turns into 40, 60 to 80 to 100. But we have to give it to them when they want it. Moms, you guys that are in the room, you know how busy you are with these kids. I watch my mom every day, the one that lives in my home and works. It's a full-time gig without the work. So we have to be accommodating to them. We can't be dictatorial and say, well, Saturday mornings is it. Fit it in or, or I guess you won't bowl. That's not a value proposition to a customer. Did I say in here one time that you shouldn't run a Saturday morning league? I did not. We should certainly still offer it on Saturdays. But we should also offer it on Sunday afternoons, probably Thursday afternoons, Tuesday, maybe Wednesday afternoons. What they want, when they want it, immediate gratification, supported in by parents, participate. What's the easiest way to immediately gratify someone for their recognition? She's got it right there. Daryl, put down your pen. Give me a good one. <laughs> nice job, buddy. Way to go. Right when they come off the lane. And again, we're not talking about a 250 game here. We're talking about 53 to 56. If we knew that person on the pair, that team, that 52 was their high score, and they got 54, we would celebrate that, wouldn't we? That's the kind of customer experience that we have to build in our centers. That's the part of the experience that I think we miss by having 56 kids in a youth program with two coaches and everybody back in the back. I mean, for the most part, a youth program is a kid going back and forth to his mom, not really socializing. There might be a basket of fries there, which as you can see, I enjoy. I'm just not sure that's a, a place for it as a Saturday morning youth program. I'm not telling you to turn your fryers off. I'm not telling you not to drive revenue. I'm saying let's get some folks down there that know what these kids are doing and their levels so that we can celebrate that. I hope that makes sense to you. And again, I just covered supported by parents, participated. Ask yourself what happens today when a kid bowls his first 100 game, first 50, 75. I mean, something as simple as maybe making the 10 pin for the first time which is more difficult for me today than it was for a long period of time. 
But those are things that are impactful for a child. I mean, they really are. And we are talking about children. We've got about until the age of 14 to get them rolling in our sport, to, t to turn them into lifetime bowlers. So if you're not committed to 8 to 12 year olds in your program, we're going to struggle. That's the group we've got to get after. Because that's when they decide what they're going to do for a lifetime. If they're not bowling 12, 13, they're probably not going to come in at 16 to 25 and play it for a lifetime. We've got to get them early on. It's just a, a piece of the male ego, if you will. But all of those things, and then first, Wusha, Wasa, Hasa, Wusha, Fudja. I can't see, you know, I didn't really do a good job of spelling that one. But does an 18-year-old boy and a 7-year-old girl want the same thing? But when you look at our membership product and the benefits that we provide for the most part into our local youth programs, that is exactly what we're delivering. Deliver the same awards program that we've been given for a number of years. And we're giving them a jersey that looks exactly the same. Flip it. Seven-year-old girl. Should a 12-year-old girl and an 18-year-old boy be bowling in the same competition on the same pair at the same time? Is that even safe? But because we've gone to a certain level, we are now okay with that because we use handicap to even the playing field. That's not a successful activation. They're not going to stay. They just aren't. And the numbers show it. A fact. It's not an award that drives these kids. It's the accomplishment itself. Anybody disagree with that? Come on, there's got to be somebody in here that's still upset that we eliminated that awards program. Somebody scoring a goal, dropping a ball, running the bases. By the way, what happens when he gets to third, makes the turn? That's something, something as simple as that we are not providing in our youth programs in this country. Wait, wait a minute, was that a lot of work? Did you... I mean, think about that. It's not the award, it's the recognition. Nice work. Hey, buddy, good job. That was really awesome. Now just reach out a little more and just touch that pin in front. And in the end, you hit the one in front, right? And then you kind of end up with some pins, and then what do you do with the second ball? You hit the one in front. Or at least get close to it and knock them into each other. So it isn't really that complicated, but yet it is if there's nobody standing there having the conversation at all. It is the recognition, and the recognition is built from the skill instruction, the coaching, the team mom, the dad, the volunteer. It's just absolutely the most important thing. The landscape of youth bowling, why do we need something different? These crazy people in Arlington are upsetting the apple cart for no reason. They've completely lost their minds. I traveled the country in last year, and I always think it's funny because I, I usually start these seminars with, how many of you think that uh, everybody in Arlington has just completely lost their minds? And 80% of the hands go up, I mean, immediately. I mean, it just is. And, and it's okay. I mean, I, I know I'm a little bit of a contrarian thinker, there's no doubt. But we wouldn't do this if we didn't think we were improving it. We really wouldn't. And, and we're not asking you to trust us. We're, we're hoping you will give us a chance. And that's the difference. I mean, so much has happened over the years. Trust is a, stuff, is a tough thing. We've been in a, in a depressed market in a declining industry. But make no mistake about it, I'm not demanding your trust. I'm asking for a shot. But I'm basing it on data. And if you look at this, on my far right are segments of bowlers in a youth program, i.e. centers that have 500 or more. Centers that have 300 to 499 kids. Centers that have 200 and then down at the bottom, uh, centers that have less than 49 bowlers. I'll step out of the way because I kind of know the numbers. But there are 4,800 bowlers in the U.S. 3,399, in my opinion, are underperforming. How do I get to that number? There are 3,386 that certify with USBC. There are four that have 500 or more kids in their programming. There are 1,899 that have less than 50. Add that 
to the almost 1,500 that don't have a youth program. Now back to the question earlier, why do we fail as an industry? I mean, that's nuts and bolts type stuff. But we could have just, you know, scooped up your 17 bucks and kept motoring and really not done anything different and just kind of let it go. But the reality is, is, you know, who believes in bowling? Who thinks it's a wonderful thing to do and something fun for our kids and the individuals? And the, right, we, everybody's going to get their arms wrapped around that. So there's a responsibility that comes with that in growing it. You know, as proprietors, we, we want to drive revenue. We want to feed our kids and send them to college and all of those things. And I believe in that. Um, but we're going to have to work a little harder at this segment. We just really are if we're going to get back into growing it. And, and I don't want to just stand up here and have an opinion. I want to show you. Right, the experts at the beginning, the data that comes with it. We've got a bunch of folks traveling around the country. And I, I ask them, hey, what are some of the things you hear when you walk into a bowling center and you talk to a proprietor or a youth director about why youth bowling might not work anymore? And these are some of the examples. Bowling isn't educational. We aren't interested if it's going to cost money. USBC is a joke. Will not be around in five years. I might want to rethink my latest career move based on what that person's saying. I mean, this is, this is kind of the culture, uh, the heartbeat, I guess, of, of youth bowling. This bowling at the bottom it just drives me nuts, but I love it. Even if I give bowling away for free, they still won't come. Come on, man. What's he say? Come on, man. So how do we reposition all of that? And if that's the environment, you know, what, do we, what is it? How are we? Where are we going? Right, I get you in a whole lot of different directions so far. I'm showing you, you know, fancy words. and Actually, I'm not because I'm, I'm not smart enough for that. But I'm kind of giving you some facts and some data. And when you look through it, bowling is dead. That one's just downright offensive to me. And I hope it is to you. And, th and those are the things. So if you were in this group or you had something to say, I think that's okay. But we can do better, and we will. I mean, we just got to believe in it a little bit. So the reality, nationally, we're the same size we were in 1958, about 190,000 kids. We peaked in 1975-76 at just under 900,000, and we've slowly declined since. Is that USBC's fault? Is that your fault, sir? You're shaking your head. No, right? Is it your fault? Is it yours? Is it yours? It's just, it just is what it is. But really, it's the fault. If I were going to place blame in one area, and, and I can do that because I got the microphone today. <laughs> it's the experience. If, if something's to blame, it's the experience that they're having in the center. And so if we'll just get centered around that and improving that, we will slowly, you know, start to rebuild. I would tell you these governance organizations are providing ten times the services they once did. You know, I've been a part of that for the last few years and I just didn't really know. I mean, I don't know if I had my head in the sand or whatever, but I really wasn't paying attention. But when you think about it, 400000 for a awards program, 800000 for a jersey program that delivers the same jersey to a 17-year-old girl as a 7-year-old boy. Is that a good experience? And I love the idea. This is the crazy thing. When that thing rolled out at Bull Expo, I was working at Ebonite. I was standing at the booth looking at it thinking, man, that's cool. That's a great idea. I mean, I was like, God, well, I mean, it, it's teams, right? It's, that's everybody, every sport's got a uniform. You know, why wouldn't it? And, and I think it did make sense for a while, but it didn't evolve. That's what you're seeing today. It didn't evolve. And now it's going to evolve today. And we're giving you the financial room to do it. Scholarships, 250, 600 grand, collegiate, bowler's ed. Bowling is a healthy way to live. Rules, NGB functions. We get in the youth area, we get a lot of help from our parents. I call our parents USBC and BPAA from a resource allocation perspective. We get a lot of help from our parents. But when you look at this, this is the reality. 
We're trending down about $350,000 a year. So a guy like me comes into a job and looks at that and doesn't really think about it today. I think about it five years from now. Wait a minute. Five years from now, that's $1.5 million. There'd be about a million dollars left. Wait a minute. There, there isn't a five years from now. So we got to go back over here and say, what do you cut? One line of thinking, well, cut, cut everything that doesn't make money. It's all about the greenbacks, if you will, right? It's all, cut everything that, so we'll cut that collegiate program. That's an easy one because it's 100 grand, it's on TV. It's really just an aspirational position for the kids anyway, so it really doesn't matter that they would want to you know, bowl in college or do something powerful later on. It doesn't make money, so we'll cut it. Right, Jack, thank you. Jack said, well, it's wrong. And so we had to reposition it in some way. Ask yourself real quick, close your eyes. Everybody close your eyes real fast. Okay, now think about what you cut. And now open your eyes and pick one out. And the really reality is, it isn't one of them. It's multiples. And it isn't this benefits package or this value proposition or any of this that's going to decide whether we get more bowlers. It's the experience that they have in the center. And so we had some options. We could raise the price. Who's in? 25 bucks instead of 17. Come on. Come on. We can still, we can still do it. We can go back and we can still, it's not, it's not August yet. We could just go back and leave the current product in place and raise the price to 25. Right? Nobody's in favor of that. Interesting. The surveys to the consumers that we did actually said that we could do this. They believed that the products were viable. But nobody in this room is raising their hands. I've been in about 30 rooms for this presentation. Nobody else raised their hands. Our channel of distribution, our marketplace wouldn't support it. Proprietors, youth directors, association managers. I'd have got run out of town, I think, pretty quickly. And, and I was, you know, for the most part, we had put a membership task force together to do this. And it's one of the exercises that we did was, okay, the price is 25, what would you put in it? We came up with some pretty cool stuff. There's a few folks in this room that were part of that. I mean, it was really a cool package. But the marketplace wouldn't support it. The second option was provide fewer services. We eliminated the magazine a few years ago. Awards. We stopped uh, production on Bolopolis videos. I put Bowler's Ed up there. We're actually investing more in Bowler's Ed, but that's the next thing that would probably get cut. Remember earlier what I said about the belief that it might be the best tool we have. So we, now we would start cutting a program that you know, could be the, the real linchpin to the whole thing if we get the experience and center set up. Now they're coming in from the schools, they come in, we got this great experience and they're here for a lifetime. You can't eliminate, start eliminating pieces. All right. You guys remember that we eliminated the magazine? Yeah, some folks did, some folks didn't. You know how many calls we got, emails when we eliminated the magazine? It's like 17. Guess how many we got when we eliminated the awards? I haven't had one day in that youth department where I had trouble getting out of bed. It's just so much fun to be a part of it every day. It just really is. But, and David's here, and, and he, he's moved on to some other things, so he, I know he'll think this is funny, and Gary and everybody in the back of the room. Those days around the awards things, those were, those were interesting days. I mean, it was all day, every day for quite a while. Phone calls and emails, great conversations and those things. But again, what would you do? Because you don't have a choice. And then, so I come from a deep consumer products background, providing value and products to the consumer, branding, which I think is a huge piece of the puzzle. And so you've got $20 in revenue and you've got 20 something dollars in expenses and you throw out to your leaders, the guy you work for or inevitably the board, you say, hey, Let's lower the price. How's that going to go over? Right? Lead balloon type thing, really, in most places, especially a for profit entity. But we're a nonprofit. We're here to you know, provide benefits and resources on the BPA side, enhance the profitability of our member centers. That's what we're here to do. So we felt like we could do that. 
We're going to lower the price. We're going to empower locals to build better programming, improve the experience, the experience that someone has, the experience that someone has when they walk into a center, and therefore they will do it more often. Empowering the locals to be better than they are by reducing the price. Terry Brenneman's in the room today. If I'd have gone to one of my bosses at Columbia all those years and said, we're lowering the price, how long would I have stuck around? <laughs> yeah, not long. But let's show you how we're going to do it. On the business side, a new model, one that invests in youth nationally. So BPA and USBC are investing in our youth area. We're saying, hey, this is the future. We're going to spend some money on it so that we can get to the locals. One that supports a local's right to choose. I misspelled right on this slide the first time. Someone reminds me in every presentation, I just refuse to change it now because I just love it that it's there, a right to choose. One that provides customizable tools for those that want specific things. I mean, the way of the world today is I want this and you want something else and what's important to you is important and I need to provide you what you need and, and Mr. Lespina, I think you've got some needs that you want and we want to service that too. It's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all world. And so again, we've got to have something for the little kids. We've got to have something for the not-so-little kids, and then we've got to have something for the big kids. But not one for everybody. It's not what they want from an experience perspective. It allows flexibility to evolve the consumer needs as they change. Imagine an award that you recognition that you would give this year. Doesn't mean you'd have to give that next year doesn't mean that you'd have to give that the following year. It could be something different every year. Imagine a seven-year-old that went all the way through our programming. They ended up with 13 jerseys that looked the same as everything else they got and a bunch of patches that every year they got the same thing. Is that a successful model? Now flip it and say, wow, they're on the red team this year, they're on the blue team next year, they're on the green team the following year. They get recognition awards this year, dog tags, brag tags, plaques. I mean, over a seven year period, you could deliver an incredible wall in their bedroom of different items that I think would be pretty cool. Everybody kind of get where I'm going here, hopefully? A new model at the consumer, new awards that are recognized as valuable. I want that, I need to achieve that, I have to have that. I am going to work harder to achieve that. Awards that are on site and ready to go. Kid Bowls' his first 50 game, right there on the approach, not six weeks later. Boom, here we go. Little Chatty Murphy down on lane seven, bowled his first 50 game. Have a big round of applause for little Chatty Murphy. <laughs> right? I mean, those, these things are not that hard. Apparel that makes sense to the individual, a team average for membership, tournaments for retention, free coaching programs for volunteers that want to be involved in the game, teach the teacher, and in the end, consumer, consumer, consumer. What do they want? Let's give it to them. What do they want? Let's give it to them. What do they need? And if they don't know what they want, let's give them what they need instead of just what's easy. The new product. I always like to give something people to think about. It works better for me. So we're going to use the GoBowling.com car. As an example, it's funny, Mr. Harbuck's in the room today. Isn't he a good-looking guy? That's John and I standing at the race last year in front of the car. It was an incredible weekend for bowling. Lots of people engaging in Bowopolis and talks about Bowler's Ed and things that were there. But it's a 43 car. $4 product with three benefits. 43. Somebody asked you in the field, hey, what's in that new product? 43. $4 product three benefits. Those benefits, membership card, and everything that goes with that, right? The rights of membership, the value of benefits, a certified average, and the ability to bowl in our USBC championship tournaments. $4 product, everybody say it, $4 product, three benefits. There are three upgrades that are available too. I had a young lady ask me yesterday about the Roll and Grow program. It's something that's been growing the last couple of years. It's still a part of the program. Oh, you're right here, I'm sorry. Um, so that, that program will still be available. You'll be able to purchase an upgrade. We've got a wonderful program with Junior Gold for our higher end bowlers. That is also an upgrade piece. $10 for the little kids, $30 for the big kids. Same benefit packages. 
No processing fees. It's four bucks. It's not five dollars, it's not eight dollars, it's not twenty dollars, it's not thirty, it's four bucks. The old dues piece no longer exists. If they are a member of USBC National, they are a member of every USBC local association in this country. All for one, one for all. If you're a three musketeer, if not, we like to just say together we can. One member across the platform for everyone, rather than a bunch of individual, well, you gotta pay this, and you gotta pay this, and you gotta pay this. However, we're recommending a registration fee. 25 bucks, start of the league, and you get all of these things with it. If you are a center that's processing, $4 would go to nationals. You're going to need somebody to process the information, the membership and the averages, the data up, right? Up into the cloud, if you will. How about an awards program? I only call it awards program because I know that's what everybody's thinking, but how about a recognition program? Maybe three bucks for that. The current awards platform I'm going to show you in a minute is still available to you at 30 cents a piece. You could build six of those awards into it at $1.80. Buy all of them you want for 30 cents a piece. Deliver them right there on site instead of after the fact. $10 deliver them apparel added. Maybe a center branded t-shirt that's got your USB-C local on it. Maybe just red, blue, green, and purple. We're going to show you a way to do that in just a second. Five, day, five bucks to operating costs or scholarships. How many of you think 25 bucks is too much for a registration fee? Okay, that's good. Well, okay, Steve, great. They got three kids. I'm with you. You got three kids, it's too much. So come back over here. I'm not going to be able to reach it. But four, three, and three. How much is that? There's your $10 program. Four and three, how much is that? I always tell everybody I'm not the smartest guy in the room, so I always like to ask for help. Right? $7 program. How about just a $4 program? Awards aren't that important because we're just going to high five everybody that comes off the approach, but maybe an apparel program. There's a $14 program in there. There's no mandate here. You can build it however you want to build it. We are empowering you to be more, I mean, who knows more about your program than you? Mr. Lespina is asking for those who haven't heard, how long will this be available? How long until we change our minds nationally and, and just say, oh, that's not going to work either? I've gotten that question a lot, but mostly it's folks, I think, that are, are highly intelligent that have seen kind of the, the past history of the last 20 years of kind of continual change of this product. I mean, and, and John also offered there, for those of you that couldn't hear him, that this is the way we used to do it. And I don't disagree with that. I just think it's a better way than the way we're doing it now. I mean, it isn't. A, I've said this I don't know how many times. Bowling is a dot, 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 dot. Hold on, Jack. A locally owned, operated, executed, community based activation. Where did the national piece fit into there? We're servicing that need. We need locals to want to do this. And I think if we'll help with some tools and some energy, for those of you that were in the presentation yesterday, you saw a lot of those tools. That's our job, is to help you be better. I want to answer your question, though. Um, the answer to the question is, uh, we're committed to this. There was a four-year commitment by BPA and USBC. Uh, I don't see it going away. I'm not going away. I'm going to believe in locals as long as I breathe, uh, but obviously if I get kicked out, to, I'm kidding. Uh, it, it's one of those tough things. It is. But if we'll get behind it, I, I think it'll be here for a long time. Because I think we deviated away from it, and the results provided something that weren't good. And so if we can get behind it and we can start showing some growth, start seeing some positive movement, I think it'll be around for a long time. Am I in a position to tell you it will be? No, I'm not. But I believe it will be because I believe this is the way that will be more successful. Again, though, I want to cover, what are you mandated to do? Four bucks. That's it. Half of me thinks that we might be even more successful if we just stuck there because we'd lower the burden of entry. 
for families, back to Steve's point. I mean, there's, there's a piece of me that really believes that right there. And I tried to put together a youth adult league last year with some folks on my block. I put the Bowler's Ed carpets out on my block. We got 20 kids that are, are less than 11 years old. We, they wouldn't stop. I mean, it was just this trail of kids bowling all day long. And so I was like, hey, let's go, everybody, let's go bowl in the league. Right? Went and tried to put it on. 34 bucks in youth memberships, 40 bucks, so now 74 in national governing body fees before anybody's thrown a ball. And believe me, there isn't one bowler on my block. So they would all be new to it. So burden of entry is a part of this too. There's no doubt. It is. Uh-oh, too far away. Uh, you're killing the, the local association. You're putting them out of business. Well, well, how do they fit? They can fit anywhere in here that they want to fit. I say they, it's a we. You know, if you believe in what your local provides and they can provide a good value benefit and a service, absolutely. I'm encouraging everyone to continue to use your local association as part of the processing fulfillment, maybe an awards program, a shirt program. Uh, but in the end, the, the proprietor would determine, generally speaking, who's going to manage their youth area. We got less than 20% of the programs in the country that actually have someone dedicated to youth. And I would also encourage you to charge a $25 registration fee just to hire someone to only work on youth. That's a good use of the money for me. Let's get somebody in our bowling centers that are passionate about this programming. I hope that makes sense to everybody. But in the end, the association could process. They could build an awards program. They could fulfill that or both. Shirt program, all the options. In the end, we are empowering locals to find a local. Everybody in this room is a local. Everybody that activates youth in any area is a local. Proprietor, local association, youth director, mom, dad, volunteer of any kind. We are completely opening up the book to let anyone activate among this. Knowing that, of course, it would have to take place in a bowling center. And that bowling center proprietor, general, general manager usually, would make that decision. I hope that's helpful for everybody. Yes, ma'am. So that's the local, what about the state? State will still do what it does today. I mean, there are no state fees. They will run tournaments and, and Pepsi championships and all the things that will go with that. They will drive revenue from those things, some philanthropy, some fundraising, those things that go with it. The role of the state association, I, I think the states are a wonderful piece. I know everybody kind of has a different opinion about that. But again, if you think about steps in the development ladder, and we want them bowling locally. We want them bowling regionally. We want them bowling at the state level. And when I say them, I'm talking about everybody. That's not just kids. That's adults, too. Jack, you had something earlier. I apologize I didn't come back to you. That's okay. I, I was here to hear this first week of all. The beauty, for those of you that couldn't hear Jack, he was rolling through the kind of benefits of the program and looking at it in a different way. The beauty of... Again, one man's opinion here of what Mr. Laspina is saying and what Jack's saying and what Ray's thinking back there and what you're thinking over there and, and over there. It's, it's now available to you. I mean, and, and I appreciate what you said, Jack, about being behind us and, and the whole piece of it. The funny part about that is, is, is I love you for saying it and I love you for actually doing it. But the reality is, is we're behind you. You're front lines. You're the ones that are activating this with the consumer at the local level. And all we're really doing is saying, hey, we're going to go back here in the back and we're going to provide benefits and services, services, service you and bowling, and we're going to have your back rather than maybe us thinking that we're you know, bigger and stronger than we are. We grow, we build, we do, we are, we will, we just can uh, if it's activated locally. I hope that makes sense to everybody. Great. Great point. Let's, let's give it a shot. Just so I don't have to double up, I apologize. Wally, I should have done that with everybody. Mr. Wally Hall. Chad, when we looked originally at the list of centers, 
that had great youth programs. You identified a number with 500 plus kids. Did you do an analysis of why some centers did better than others? And, and what did you find was the common ingredient in terms of those that had successful youth programs? And how have you catered for that within the program that you're proposing? Yeah, what well, we did, absolutely. There are a couple things that are central to it. One of them I talked about a minute ago is someone dedicated to youth. That is a, a secret. It's not even a secret. I always go to the secret sauce. That's the commitment. We've got to have somebody dedicated to youth in the programming. And most of those programs that are in the largest cycle, I put those top two in buckets. Uh, active uh, or a, excuse me offer a varying degree of activation so it isn't just Saturday morning it's Saturday morning Tuesday afternoon Thursday afternoon as an example in the case that we referenced yesterday all but one day of, um, of the seven days in a week had something for youth on it so you couple those two things together someone that is passionate about the youth programming actually operating it and offering it more when the consumer wants it uh, those are two big pieces of it. Kind of ancillary pieces as you go down. The lower your rate is of coach per kid, so if you end up with one volunteer versus 25 kids versus one and eight, we find that the lower ratio provides more success. So great question. Yeah, and just to hit Bob's point, and we'll, we'll get you in just a second, uh, one more question and then let's finish the presentation then we'll come back to any questions. But uh, to Bob's point, Go put your best five moms in a room. Literally, your best five moms. Put them in a room and ask them if they'd be interested in helping out. I mean, youth, youth baseball programs, soccer, I mean, it's all run by volunteers. They're, they're not always paid positions. I mean, I, I get to watch the mom that lives in my house. I, it's incredible to me what a group of moms can accomplish. A national PTA organization, if you will. I mean, when you think about it. That's kind of how it all starts. Get your best five moms in a room. There are people that are passionate about this and will help. Uh, will there be a new, like, uh, individual sanction card so that parent can check off whether he wants 25 for three, or how's that going to go about? 25 for three. Well, you just said it would be $25, or they can pay four, they can pay three. Will there be something? No, no. The, the membership card is $4. All of the other pieces within it are just options for the center to charge. In theory, the no, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There's going to be one card. The center would detail what goes into the experience. So if they, if you said it's a $25 registration fee and you put it on your your flyer, your youth flyer, and in that 25 box is uh, a shirt, an awards program, all of those other things, you could detail what it is for the 25 bucks. Youth registration fees are very common in youth sports. Very common. And they're expensive. And usually a uniform comes with it. I mean, almost always. Um, but the membership component, four bucks. All the cards will be the same. Four dollars. The actual membership component is a separate piece from the rest. And that's why it's the only mandate. It's just going to have the four bucks. You guys could build whatever you wanted to in terms of marketing and POS to, to determine that. And again, that, I, I know it takes some work to operate a youth program, but, but we aren't going to build those things in anymore because we're reducing the price down to a level um, that we think is important. I want to get through the, the rest of the piece. Awards, I know everybody wants them. They still exist. We didn't eliminate them. They're here for you if you want them. They're 30 cents a piece. It's the same awards program that we've all, all, excuse me, always delivered. You can buy them directly from us. You can certainly buy them from your local association if they choose to provide that to you. Uh, 30 cents a piece. 1.7 million of these awards given out in the marketplace last year for 166,000 kids. We call them special achievement awards. 1.7 million of them for 166,000 kids. I'm not sure the word special. Uh, should be a part of this. But if you want them exactly the way they are today, they are available to you. We have eliminated nothing. You will need to purchase them, I would tell you, in bulk, because there's going to be some freight that goes with it that you'll be responsible for, and then deliver them as the kids earn the awards. 
Again, it's no different than, you know, I, I hate to bottle it up, it's no different than buying beer, chicken wings, Pepsi, whatever it is. You operate your business, this is one of the things that you're going to offer as a value proposition. You buy them at the beginning, you parcel them out as the scores are awarded with a very simple congratulations. Other possibilities, again, we talked about rewards that are valued. This is my son's, uh, they call it uh, spirit sticks. This is something that we're developing, but you'll see this one, citizenship, bookworm, perfect attendance, honor roll. Our school, grade school, used to have a t-shirt program. Everybody in the school got a t-shirt and they had these little patches for all of these individual things that they would sew on the shirts. Right? My mom, my mom in my house sewed them on the shirts. The kid went to school. They discontinued the program and they went to this. I was like, that's interesting. So I went over and sat with Kimmy Etheridge, who's our principal, and I said, Kimmy, why did you, what, what happened? Why did you eliminate the shirt program? And she said, well, it didn't work. And I said, why? And she said, well, the kids didn't wear the shirts. They were all the same shirts. Kids want to be unique today. And then, the, you know, the work that it took for the parents to sew on the patches didn't work either. So we just went away from the program. And I said, why this? She said, every kid carries a book bag to school, and it affixes right to the edge of the book bag. What do we have that usually somebody walks into our center with or goes to the locker to pull out of that something like this could be activated against? A bowling bag. We're not that much different from a grade school in that area. So literally, imagine 50, 75, 100, 150. Is there any reason not to have citizenship in a youth bowling program? Add citizenship. Perfect attendance. Is there any reason not to have perfect attendance in a youth bowling program? There's all kinds of things that are outside of the scores that should be offered. And this is something that we could add. They're not that much more expensive. If you go to youthbowlingawards.com, we have farmed this out. We are not participating. We're not involved in any way. We are just, again, servicing you with options where you can go get these things as inexpensively as possible. We are taking no money from it. It is completely uh, between you and them to achieve. But just another example, brag tags, medals, I mean, these are all things that we used to do and we used to be very successful with, back to uh, Mr. Laspina's point. We used to do this. It used to be commonplace. National swooped in and said, you're probably not doing a good job, so now we're going to do it for you. But it turned into this one-size-fits-all thing. Now we're going back and, and catering to the individual. But imagine that one year, one of these the next, one of these the next. There's just all kinds of ways to do this. You have options, tools for your tool belt to attract these bowlers. We built new awards for you, again, that would fix on that key ring and go on the, on the book bag. These are available today at youthbowlingawards.com. So we're not getting out of the awards business. We're just getting out of the awards business. We're putting you with vendors who do this professionally. You won't be asking us, hey, where, why didn't my thing ship and why didn't you process it and why I can't see this in Wind Labs and I can't, all these electron, all that goes away. You go to Youth Bowling Awards, you pick out the things you want, you put in a credit card and they ship it to you. The way of the world, right? At least I hopeful it is. Apparel, this is how we've been doing it. 181,000 of these last year. This is how everybody else does it. Which one would be more accepted by the consumer? If you had 10 teams, three man teams in your youth league, imagine a red team, a blue team, a purple team, a yellow team, a Aubert's Air team, a, I'm kidding. All the different colors of the rainbow. What can you do if we do it this way? Mr. Lespina, what will you put on it? He'll put his logo on it. We're creating an affinity with our... Sorry? Big one, right, big one. We'll create an affinity with our customer back to our community gathering place. Now it's a community activation. I'm part of a team. I might have my brother or my sister bowling on it. We're the warriors. Tigers, lions, and bears, oh my. No Indians. No Indians, right, no Indians. Certainly no, yeah. 
he almost got me in trouble with what I was going to say next, but obviously the Redskins have something to say about that. But I mean, think about all the possibilities here and what it would do to, again, improve the experience. We're trying to improve the experience. Had somebody say recently, well, you guys are just, you want me to do your job. No, I want you to do your job. Right? If we do this, it's going to look like this. Because we're going to buy 190,000 of them because we've got to get it, get it so cheap and so inexpensive because we're not going to be able to raise the price. I had somebody ask me, why are you putting yourself out of a job? I said, because it's the right thing to do. The local's going to determine whether bowling's successful. I promise you. I promise you. I promise you. The local's going to determine that. They just are. Had somebody else say, that's too expensive. I can't do that. Again, we built 10 bucks in to that model for you to do exactly this. Live look at a website, jiffyshirts.com. Yellow, kind of off yellow. Mustard, blue, red, black, aqua. I'm not sure what color that is, but I know the girls like it. Look at these prices. You buy them in bulk. They ship to your center. You drive, in some cases, three blocks to a shirt stop. You put Maple Family Fun Centers on the back of it. Maybe a USB-C local. Ready to rock. Four greens, four reds, four blues. The funniest part of this, and I think this is one of those hilarious things, but everybody expected all of those jerseys to fit perfectly. <laughs> right? How many baseball teams you get the jersey and it's uh, my seven-year-old, he's, well, he's got, he, got, he got saddled with what I have here, right? So he's, he's a good-looking man, but he's short and stocky. And so every time he's first, you know, his shirt's right down there to his knees. Do we take it back? Yeah, no. No, this is the world. This is it. So all you have to do is be fundamentally sound. You with me? Can I understand? Hopefully everybody's on the same page. I'm not here to be offensive, but I am here to challenge you. So we believe in apparel programs. Uh-oh. We act absolutely do. We believe in programs that deliver anything you want. Not 1.7 million of them at a time. If you've got 35 kids in your program, 35 of them at a time. If you've got 140 kids in your program, 140 at a time. And the costs associated with that. This is just a slide that I used with our task force of kind of things that were possible. Hats, sports necklaces, silicone bracelets. I mean, there's a lot of things here. I mean, if you want them specific to bowling, something that they can put their shoes in. There's a jet pack or a small backpack there. Most everything on here is very inexpensive. I would tell you this, I think this accessory bag is the most expensive. Shoe covers, something for a bowling center. But something one year, something the next, something the next, something the next. Not the same every time. Hopefully that makes sense. Question? Is there any talk about doing that with USB-C for the Oh boy, you know, we, somebody's gonna, you know. The youth, this is a youth seminar. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, you know, I think, I think the adult piece is a, is a, a certainly another challenge uh, that'll have to be addressed and looked at, and, and we'll do that. But I will tell you, you know, 12 months from now, we're going to have a lot of data. You know, we're going to have a lot of, of data points on a graph, if you will youth and adult together, if you think about all the things that are being implemented this August 1st, informed a long time ago. But we're going to learn a lot. The thing that I would tell you is, you know, if this isn't successful in the youth marketplace, the answer is no. Yeah, so, but I do remember a time, you know, you, you go back a lot of years, I mean, I'm a product of a youth bowling program. We all are in some shape or form. I'm a product of my mother's youth bowling program. I know what it takes to run one. I watched it. 
I believe in it. But it does take some elbow grease. And it does take some commitment. And we've got to get back to that. I mean, a lot of what John was talking about a minute ago, we were all products of that. We grew out of it because of the experience that was created at that time by individuals that were passionate about the program. They just were. New processing system, I'm going to run you through some screenshots real fast. Um, we're to that point. Next week, uh, every bowling center in this country that's in member max as a BPA member will get an email address, or excuse me, will get an email blast to activate their youth portal. Every association in this country will also get an email to activate their youth portal. 5,000 centers, all the associations to go with it. Um, everyone's going to have the opportunity to process. And then you guys will work it out in the marketplace, actually, who will process. Obviously, we'll fill the gaps or the voids at National. We have folks that just can't work it out. We'll certainly take care of that while we try to help you work it out. Because in the end, we want locals working with locals to, to build the programming. Real quick, that's what it looks like. That's what you'll see. You'll activate the piece. Um, pretty simple, not a whole lot to it. What you're going to notice about this processing system to maybe the one you're currently using is it's, it's really trimmed down. We took a lot of the, not that they're not useful information, but over 30 years we collected a lot of, well, we, it would be great if we had this, and it would be great if we had this, and it would be great if we had this, and it would be great if we had this, and then we didn't use any of the data. So we've gotten it down to basically processing a membership. You'll move into this. This is your, and I apologize, you guys aren't going to completely be able to see this, but stop by the booth. This is your league setup and certification. You know your league application that you fill out? This is it. You'll do it right here. Now, does that mean you have to do it right here? The answer is no. Everything that you were using before is still in place. If you want to fill out the league app, give it to the association. You fill out your individual certification cards, give it to the association. Those things are all there. The local association is going to see the same screen. So they will use the same system. Everybody with me on that? Everybody's going to be working off the same platform. The only difference is, is if you're a proprietor and you go directly, you'll be the one doing it. If the association's doing it, they'll be doing it. You will share the information. Steve, as an example, certifies one league. It's a small after-school league, but he wants his bulk of his program to still go to the association. He'll process the one. The association will process the others. You guys will be able to look at the data. It's your data. You own it. But the association needs it to market all the things that they do association tournaments and all the things that go with that. So we'll share the data. Will John Laspina be able to see Steve's data? No. We won't have centers competing with each other that will have visibility of that data. But the bowling center and the association will share the data. As it should be. Together we can. Okay, next step. Start processing it. Oh, I apologize. I did this the other day. They're out of order. That right there is the next screen, so you just certify the league. So this is what it'll look like. And then you'll go in and you'll start putting members in. The cards that have been created for you don't look that much different than they did before. But they will now follow these prompts. So your new application is just in line, it almost looks exactly like this. So if you were processing the data, you would take line one and you would put it in on line one, line two, Line two, we made it very simple and easy to use. Very simple. They'll marry to each other. One major change. Actually, let me, let me get behind something here real quick. One major change. There's an email required with every member. Are they done? Don't throw anything. We want the data. You want the data. We want you to have the data. We want to be talking about how you use the data. We want to help you build better marketing from the data. If we don't have the data, we can't do it. We need the email addresses. You need the email addresses. Direct mail works, but not as easy as email marketing, and it's a lot more expensive. 
Not to mention there's some legal things that go with it. I mean, we've, we've got to have the email address because we've got to have somebody governing that child and saying it's okay. It's a safety issue. I don't know how much you know about COPA, but it's a big piece. No, sir. There's a family portal that goes with it. So inevitably, then you get to now activating memberships. So all your members will fall into this pending category. And then next to that, we'll go pay. This one is by credit card. And then this one's by EFT. So two options, credit card or EFT. You can pay for them all at the same time, every league, if you will. Um, or you can go as you process. You could literally process one member each time you do it. I don't think that's a good idea, but you could. Then you would process your leagues into a MasterCard or EFT. Very simple and easy to use. I mean, if you think about all the things that we were taking before, this one's pretty easy. So a summary of the model locally. I love this slide. I built it because I was trying to be a jerk, if you will. You can build it to be anything you want. You can price it any way you want. You can support any channel distribution you want. Or you can do nothing. And we'll just keep moving on. Or we can do something and maybe create an affinity with a new generation of kids. My last message is we're here to help you deliver that something. We're, we're not going to leave you hanging. You're not out there on an island. Um, and that's a terrible slide. I didn't update it. But we've got some field specialists that are moving around the country right now. We've hired six folks to move around. Our entire youth department's there. We've got backup from our parents, folks at BPA and USBC. In the end, we're all in this together. I mean, we, we just are. I disagree with that. There's not a local or state tournament in the country, I think, that doesn't offer a handicap tournament. I know Pepsi's all scratched. Pe Pepsi's all scratched, you're correct. You think but that's fair for the, the lower average bowlers? <laughs> I guess we're going to talk about handicap. How many folks here have seen a soccer game start 3 0? How many have seen a baseball game start 5 to nothing? How many of you have seen a basketball game start 12 to nothing? Handicap has a wonderful place in our industry on the recreational side of the game. You ask, do I think it's fair? Mm, it's not a fairness issue for me. It's not, a, it's not a piece of the puzzle that's even really part of it. It's about getting these kids in a peer-to-peer -peer environment and being measured on a model that can be successful. You know, because handicap we have in place, we allow nine-year-olds to bowl with 17-year-olds, and we think that's a positive experience, and it just isn't. Okay, I, I think you've got a little bit of an ulterior motive here, and that's okay, and we'll discuss it. But how about a draft league that puts the best kid with the worst kid, teams that are competitive against each other like everybody else does it? That's a successful environment. That is a wonderful environment. The environment that we do brings two nine-year-olds together, one that's been bowling for three years and one that just started in the game and is improving. The nine-year that's been there for three years, we have a stable environment of an average that's been tracked. So we know how good that kid is. We've got another nine-year-old that just started that's picking up the sport, started at a 40 average, is now at a 70 average, but still bowling off a 40 average. You want to get into fairness. I think you just penalized the nine-year-old that's been here for three years. There has to be a level of development. There has to be a standard that's met and kept. Now, again, I say to you, I believe in handicap as part of this game, but we have to separate the recreation from the sport. Every other sport has done it and is successful. You show me one sport that starts off a game five to nothing, and I'll show you a sport that's struggling to keep people playing it. Anybody want to do that? Yeah, nobody wants to do that. The recreational side of the game, it has a place. It's not a, this, and I apologize, because, I apologize because I am going to be a little direct. This is not a black and white world. There is a ton of gray. We can have both. We can have our cake and eat it too. 
But it can't be one way. And the one way that has existed for the last 10 or 12 years is handicap. We've continued to press. 66 and two-thirds used to be enough, right? And then it was 80, and then it was 90, and now it's 100. Better bowling balls, smoother lane surfaces, better lane machines. We've, we've gone past it. Now we've got to drag it back and find the sweet spot. Yes, sir, someone else had... Yeah, I, I would even submit to you that your Saturday morning program stays handicapped for the next 100 years, but your Sunday afternoon you provide something that's more sport related. That's more in a scratch perspective. Eights and nine-year-olds bowling against eight and nine-year-olds. Tens, twelves. I mean, there's just so many ways to be successful in this. But what I would submit to you is, you want to keep running handicap? Fire away, man. If you get passionate about it and you believe in it, we'll have more kids going bowling. I want whatever it is that's going to get you to drive programming. But I promise you, the solution is not at the national level. It's local activation. We're going to govern flatly, evenly, and fairly. That's where we're headed moving forward. We're going to provide options for anyone that would want them. And then the consumer chooses. A mom says, I want to bowl in that handicap league because that makes sense to me. Another mom over here says, I want to bowl in this scratch position because that makes sense to me. They don't have options today. It's pretty much a one-way highway the way we've been doing it. You got one back there, Sean? Uh, you had mentioned different percentages of handicap. What would seem like a, uh, a reasonable percentage for youth league or for leagues in general? Handicap. A reasonable percentage. By the math, you know, for kids that haven't progressed in the game that are starting out, uh, it would be a smaller percentage than ones that are, have been involved. If you had everybody that had been involved for 10 years, it would be easy to pick that percentage. But because we've got kids in varying degree of skill levels, you have to go with a smaller number. I would tell you 66 and two-thirds probably still works for kids. But we have progressed way past it, mostly because of adults. We didn't tailor it back to the kids. That's a very simple answer to your question. I apologize for that, but that's, that's the one that's available. Yes, ma'am. We've got 10 minutes left. What we've done with handicap is we dropped it down per division. Bantams, you're only getting 80% of about 120 because we don't have anybody over a 120 in Bantams. We, once they get to that, they're up in juniors. Juniors, we do about 75% of 175. We're dropping it down, they're still there, but it's not overpowering the league. So you get these people that are bowling off of artificially low averages. Also, on the, on the tournament side, I run about 35 tournaments a year, and the handicap, there are so many kids now that play the handicap game. Oh, their league average is the same year after year after year, but they can kill it at tournaments. You can't come into a tournament, a sports shot tournament, in like a handicap division with a weaker shot than the scratch division is bowling, bowl a 600, on a 135 average and it happens tournament after tournament and that kills the tournaments faster than anything else. Yeah. The scratch divisions are exploding at tournaments. Yeah, and they're, go they're going to. I mean, the, the scratch models are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger because it's the only way to really get fairness. I kind of don't quite understand. I'd like to hear more about what you're talking about. Maybe we can do it separately, but I like the idea of varying the, the percentage. I do. Um, at the end of the day, you know, what we're talking about and all this fairness issue, the question that comes from it, we're talking about money. Because for the most part, we're going to end up talking about scholarships. And because there's scholarships in it, how does the, lay, the field lay? Right? There's folks that want to tip it to a bowler on the handicap side, and there's another group that wants to tip it to the scratch side. All we're saying, to be very specific, is they are two different models. You want to bowl in handicap and you want it tipped that way, here's an option for you. You want to bowl on the scratch side, here's an option for you. These folks wouldn't necessarily bowl over here. It's money. It's scholarships. That's what we're talking about. I think there was a question back here. Did you have one? We, we, we again, we sent out the information one year in advance of launch and we lowered the price from 17 to 4 to give every local in the country a revenue stream to pay for it. 
The accepted price in the marketplace is $17. So there's a $13 window that can be used to do exactly what you talked about. If we'd have left the price the same, yeah, we might have had a little bit of a trouble with that. But the reality is we gave everybody a year and a $13 window to work within the model. Any other questions? Inevitably you could, yeah. I mean, you'd have to create a pretty big family account within it. But again, it's not necessarily a kid's email address. We want a parent's email address. We'd like a kid's as a secondary, uh, but it just has to be tied to a email address. You can get creative in the system. I mean, yep, yep, especially 13 and unders per COPA. Any other questions? So here's the thing. Here's what we'll close with, a little fun, because it got a little off the tracks there towards the end. Um, there's obviously some passionate people about bowling in the room, and I appreciate that. My favorite quote of all time is that passion beats talent. Passion at people and talented people side by side going in the same direction, a passionate person will win every time. It's when you combine the two of them together, passion, talent, great things are possible. And you can do good things as a passionate person, I think you can do good things as a talented person. We want to do great things, we've got to have both. And those are the folks that we want to look for in our programming. Those are the folks that we want to look for when we're deciding who's going to manage a youth director. I put this slide up here. Um, it's important. You know, we kind of created this new mantra, the Association Outreach Committee at USBC came up with this together we can and, and I just felt really, I loved it because I think it's a message that a few of us have been trying to send for a couple years. And we can disagree about things. We can haggle, we can argue. Guys, give me 45 more seconds if you don't mind. We can, we can discuss, we can go back and forth, we can agree to disagree. But there's one thing that's going to be very true, and that if this thing is going to turn around and we are going to be successful, we are going to have to trust each other. We're going to have to come together in ways that we have not been able to. I've been making the joke lately, you want to go to the circus, go to the circus. You want to be a part of the circus, apply to be part of the circus. Bowling will start to move forward when we stop having these conversations that are so volatile, so personal. Something as simple as separating the handicap from the scratch in this game, which, oh, by the way, when we were all kids and bowling was more successful, there were scratch leagues for the scratch bowlers and there was handicap leagues for the handicap bowlers. But this is a very impactful slide for me, and I hope it will be for you. BPA and USBC have really come together at the national level. We're not the same. We run different nonprofits. We manage our businesses differently. But we're working together to be successful long term. We are. And if we'll do that locally, if you guys will commit to working with your local associations, your local associations will commit to working with you in a positive way, we'll get back to some really successful times. I remember when I was a kid, they kicked us out. We had the biggest uh, bowling center in the state, a little small town in Kansas. They kicked us out the second Saturday every year for the state coaching clinic because our center just was one of those things that was big enough to handle everything. We had 240 coaches, excuse me, volunteers that would come in to get their certifications. It wasn't a national program, it was a local program. We're providing that in a different way today. My point was I was irritated because every year I had to not bowl on a Saturday morning because of this piece. We can get back to that. I didn't realize how important that was at the time. In the end, here's the message. This is a new system. I'm not asking you to trust me. I'm not asking you to trust us. I'm asking you to give us a chance. I'm not here to do your job. You're certainly not here to do mine. Let's just trust each other a little bit to get to the point where we can start to move this thing forward. I'm a big believer that it's possible that bowling can do better or be better than it is today. And I hope you will too. Thanks for your time, energy. Have a wonderful Bowl Expo. Thanks for being here.